The history of America's contributions to surgery is a distillate of the history of surgery in our country. Every story has a beginning, and it's appropriate to begin our saga of America's contributions to surgery on this, the south shore of Galveston Island. On November 6, 1528, Cabeza de Vaca, translated as the head of a cow, landed on this south shore with a group of Spaniards. Over the next eight years, he and the only three other survivors of his original group lived among the Indians and traveled as far west as what is presently New Mexico, and then south to Culiacan on the west coast of Mexico itself. During that period of life among the Indians, he was adopted as a medicine man, and as such performed an operation that he chronicled in a book that he wrote and published in Spain in 1542. That book, La Relacion, documents the first operative procedure performed on North American soil. Only two copies of La Relacion are known to exist. Included in Devaca's chronicle of his life in the New World is the operative report that reads, I touched him and felt the arrowhead and saw that he traversed the cartilage. Uh, with the knife I had, I opened his chest, the spot, and saw that the point was crosswise and very difficult to remove. I continued to cut. I inserted the point of the knife, and with great difficulty, I finally extracted it. It was very long. With a deer bone, using my knowledge of surgery, I took two stitches, following which he bleed profusely all over me. With hair from the skin, I stopped the flow of blood. Another day, I cut the Indians two stitches, and he was well. The wound that I had made was no more apparent than a crease in the palm of the hand. The next accounts of operations on North American soil describe the removal of a bladder stone and the amputation of a breast for cancer. These reports appeared in 1710 and 1720 editions of North America's oldest newspapers. Both of these procedures were carried out by Zabdiel Boylston, who gained fame by performing the first inoculation against smallpox in America. The foremost surgeon in the colonies at the time of the American Revolution was John Jones. It was Jones who cared for British and American troops at the Battle of Lake George in 1755 during the French and Indian War. Twelve years later, in 1767, he was appointed as the first professor of surgery at New York City's King's College, which would become Columbia University College of Medicine. Jones authored the first surgical book published in the colonies, the 1775 edition of plain, concise, practical remarks on the treatment of wounds. In 1524, the Hospital of Jesus of Nazareth opened its doors in Mexico. It's the oldest hospital in continuous use in the Americas. In 1639, Hotel Dieu was established in Quebec. And five years later, a hospital by the same name began its history in Montreal. The first hospital to be built in the colonies was the Pennsylvania Hospital, in which I am presently standing. In 1751, largely related to the efforts of Dr. Thomas Bond and Benjamin Franklin, it received its charter. In 1755, the cornerstone was laid, and in 1794, Philip Singh Physic, who would become known as the father of American surgery, join the staff. I'm now in the so-called circular room that had been built in 1804. 
Although an operating room had been built a year earlier at the New York Hospital, it lasted a brief time, and this is certainly the oldest extant operating room in the United States, and is actually unique in design in that it was specifically planned to be next to the recovery rooms. This room served as an operating theater and lecture hall for 64 years, with more than 130 people in attendance on occasion. On December 27, 1805, Philip Singh Physic operated on a gentleman and removed a seven-pound tumor from his parotid gland. This is the preserved specimen. Philip Singh Physic, who trained under John Hunter at St. George's Hospital in London, received many honors in his lifetime. Physic was part of the intellectual ferment of Philadelphia, and his contributions included the use of a gastric tube for lavage, needle forceps for ligation of blood vessels, and absorbable sutures for which he used treated buckskin. He was disinclined to write and spent most of his middle and old age at home as a recluse. Physic was to play a peripheral role in one of America's most significant contributions to surgery. At about the same time, west of the Allegheny Mountains in rural Danville, Kentucky, a town of fewer than a thousand inhabitants, a major event took place. The two central figures in the drama that raised the curtain on the entire field of abdominal surgery were a daring surgeon, Ephraim McDowell, and a courageous patient, Jane Todd Crawford. McDowell, considered the premier surgeon west of the Alleghenies, was asked to see Mrs. Crawford, a 45-year-old mother of four children. Local physicians believed that she was pregnant. McDowell traveled from Danville to the Crawford cabin to examine Mrs. Crawford on December 13, 1809. He concluded that she was not pregnant, but that she had an enlarged ovarium. He later wrote in his article, Having never seen so large a substance extracted, nor heard of an attempt or success attending any operation such as this required, I gave to the unhappy woman information of her dangerous situation. She appeared willing to undergo an experiment, which I promised to perform if she would come to Danville a distance of 60 miles from her place of residence. Mrs. Crawford rode several days on horseback, and on Christmas Day, 1809, the momentous operation was performed. The operation probably took place in the very room in which I'm presently standing, though as you can see, it's been refurbished. McDowell was assisted by his nephew, a physician, who actually strongly dissuaded him from performing the procedure that had never been done successfully before. Anesthesia had not been introduced, and we're led to believe that Jane Todd Crawford managed pain by repeating psalms and hymns throughout the procedure. Eight years later, McDowell would report his experience, and in that report he wrote, the tumor then appeared full in view, but was so large that we could not take it away entire. We put a strong ligature around the fallopian tube near the uterus, and then cut open the tumor, which was the ovarium and fimbrious part of the fallopian tube very much enlarged. We took out 15 pounds of a dirty, gelatinous-looking substance, after which we cut through the fallopian tube and extracted the sac, which weighed seven pounds and one half. We then turned her upon her left side so as to permit the blood to escape, after which we closed the external opening with interrupted sutures. In five days, I visited her, and much to my astonishment, found her engaged in making up her bed. I gave her a particular caution for the future, and in 25 days, she returned home as she came, in good health, which she continues to enjoy. Because of his conservative nature, McDowell delayed reporting his result until he had performed the operation successfully on the next two patients. 
Seven years after the original operation, McDowell's nephew carried the report of this experience with the three operations to Philip Singh Physic, with the request that it be published if found worthy. Physic declined publication. Thomas James, a professor of midwifery at the University of Pennsylvania, accepted McDowell's paper, and the article appeared in the 1817 edition of the Eclectic Repertory and Analytical Review. Two years later, McDowell's second and only other contribution to the literature appeared in the same journal. In that article, he reported yet two additional personal cases of removal of disease ovaria, and he responded to the criticisms generated by his first article. At the same time that the report was submitted to Physic, McDowell dispatched another copy to his Edinburgh teacher, John Bell. But because Bell was not there when the report arrived, it fell into the hands of Bell's assistant, John Lazars, who put it aside for eight years. In 1824, Mr. Lazars reported in the Edinburgh Medical Journal his own unsuccessful attempt to remove an ovarian tumor, and he included the report of McDowell's first three patients. After publication of Lazar's work, McDowell became the center of ridicule. Dr. James Johnson of London wrote, In despite of all that has been written respecting this cruel operation, we entirely disbelieve that it has ever been performed with success, nor do we think it ever will. A year later, Johnson would relent, saying, A back settlement of America, Kentucky, has beaten the mother country, nay, Europe itself, with all the boasted surgeons thereof, in the fearful and formidable operation of gastrotomy, with extraction of diseased ovaria. Jane Todd Crawford enjoyed good health for 33 years after her operation and died at age 78, outliving her surgeon by 20 years. Because of Ephraim McDowell's extraordinary and unprecedented success, he has truly earned the title of the father of abdominal surgery. The next major American contribution to surgery also took place on the frontier, far removed from the relatively sophisticated medical centers of the day. Once again, there were two players, a surgeon and one unusual patient. In this case, it was not a dramatic surgical intervention that occurred. It was a series of continued, deliberate, scientific investigations on that unique patient that led to the birth of surgical physiology. The surgeon was William Beaumont, the patient Alexis St. Martin, and the monumental event was the publication of a book in 1833. William Beaumont was born in Lebanon, Connecticut, and at age 23 had set up medical practice in Plattsburgh, New York. When the War of 1812 broke out, Beaumont left his practice and enlisted in the Army as an acting surgeon's mate. At the end of the war, he returned to his Plattsburgh practice. In 1819, when the American Army was reorganized and his military colleague James Lovell was appointed Surgeon General, Beaumont was assigned to Fort Mackinac, situated on the island of Michilimackinac, where Lakes Michigan and Huron meet. On June 6, 1822, Alexis St. Martin, a 19-year-old French-Canadian trapper, also known as a voyageur, entered this American Fur Company trading post. Inside, he was standing next to a rifle when it accidentally went off, making a large wound in his left side. The chest wall of Alexis St. Martin was torn open. The diaphragm and stomach were lacerated, and part of the lung and stomach protruded through the wound. Beaumont attended to St. Martin in the trading post and then cared for him in the community's hospital. When funds ran out and the community would no longer provide care for the injured man, Beaumont took him home and continued to care for the patient and for the wound that resulted in a permanent gastric fistula. In 1825, the case was first reported in the medical recorder 
erroneously crediting the Surgeon General Lovell, but this was later corrected. The following year, in the same journal, the first four experiments performed on St. Martin were reported. The studies were interrupted while St. Martin lived in Canada and resumed in 1829 at Fort Crawford on the upper Mississippi near Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. Between 1829 and 1833, a series of classic experiments was conducted taking advantage of the permanent gastric fistula in order to study gastric juice and the process of digestion. Experiments and observations on the gastric juice and physiology of digestion was published in Plattsburgh, New York in 1833. Three engravings depict the fistulous wound as it ordinarily presented with the valve depressed to allow direct visualization of the lumen of the stomach and the appearance of the prolapsed gastric mucosa. The work reported the first study of a physiologic process in a living human being. In this 280-page book, based on observations of the naked eye and limited chemical analyses, Beaumont provided a description of gastric juice, the identification of hydrochloric acid as the important acid in gastric juice, the demonstration that gastric juice and mucus were separate solutions with different characteristics, proof that mental disturbances alter gastric secretion, motility of the stomach wall, that digestion within the stomach is a chemical process, and he showed that different articles of diet have different digestibility. This book is the only medical work included on the Grolier Club list of the 100 most influential books published in the United States before the 20th century. Beaumont moved from Prairie du Chien to the Jefferson Barracks outside St. Louis and was offered the chair of surgery at what was then called the St. Louis University Medical School, but he couldn't accept the position because of his military commitment. Eventually, he left the Army and continued medical practice in St. Louis until his death in 1853. Alexis St. Martin, the patient on whom all the experiments had been carried out, died in Canada at age 83. Beaumont's deliberate and careful research is emblematic of his credo. Truth, like beauty, when unadorned, is adorned the most. And in prosecuting these experiments and inquiries, I believe I have been guided by its light. Also far from the urban fountainheads of American medicine in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, James Marion Sims was born in Hanging Rock, South Carolina and established a practice in Montgomery, Alabama. It was there in June 1845 that Sims participated in a traumatic forceps delivery that resulted in a vesicovaginal fistula. Shortly after he made this diagnosis in Anarka, he was asked to see Betsy and then Lucy. All three young women were slaves with a debilitating condition that defied surgical cure. Sims devised a speculum for improving the visualization of the cervix, the vaginal wall, and the fistulous opening. Initially, he used the handle of a bent pewter spoon. Later, it was modified into a duck-billed shape. He cared for and housed these women at his own expense in the back of his office. A series of patients suffering from the same condition was referred to him for surgical repair, but failure followed failure for almost four years. Sims wondered if the silk sutures precluded healing, and he had a jeweler make a fine wire of silver to be used in place of the silk. In May 1849, using the silver sutures, success was finally achieved. The patient Anarka had undergone 29 previous operations all without the benefit of anesthesia. The irony is that seven years earlier, in 1842, in the neighboring state of Georgia, Crawford Long had already successfully used sulfuric ether as an anesthetic agent, but had not published his results. In 1852, in the American Journal of Medical Sciences, Sims reported his successful achievement. A series of patients, including Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy, whose vesicovaginal fistulas had been permanently closed. Sims moved to New York City in 1853, establishing home and office on Madison Avenue. He championed the establishment of a hospital for treatment of diseases of women, and his dream was realized when the first woman's hospital opened at 83 Madison Avenue. <laughs> 
Sims, who is generally regarded as the father of modern gynecology, was elected president of the American Gynecological Society, the American Medical Association, and he devoted his final years to the establishment of a hospital dedicated to the care of cancer patients. This evolved as the New York Cancer Hospital, later Memorial Sloan Kettering. As the first half of the 19th century was coming to an end, operating emphasized speed to minimize the period of extreme pain. Amputation, the most commonly performed operation, was carried out in minutes. Baron Loray, Napoleon's surgeon, who performed 200 amputations on the battlefield in a 24-hour period, could disarticulate a shoulder joint in one minute. The British surgeon Robert Liston could amputate a leg in two minutes. Most patients relied on prayers, singing, and mesmerism for distraction. A few had pain blunted by opium or whiskey. And then came surgical anesthesia and the convoluted history of its discovery and the acknowledgement of its discoverers. Almost all would agree that what took place in this room was America's greatest contribution to the field of surgery. It was here in the ether dome of the Massachusetts General Hospital that William Thomas Green Morton conducted the first public demonstration of ether anesthesia. Ether had actually been discovered in the 16th century and was named in 1730 by Frobenius. But 300 years would elapse between the discovery of the compound and appreciation of its anesthetic properties. But let's leave this room and visit Jefferson, Georgia to consider the contributions of Crawford W. Long. On March 30, 1842, one year after opening his practice, Long used sulfuric ether applied on a soap towel to achieve anesthesia for a painless removal of a tumor from the back of the neck of James Venable. Long did not report his experience until seven years later after he learned of the experience that took place at the Massachusetts General Hospital. In December 1849, Crawford Long published his report in the Southern Medical and Surgical Journal and included in that report his first use of ether anesthesia, his second operation on the same patient, and four other procedures that he performed under ether anesthesia before October 1846. Three of the four witnesses in the painting that portrays Long's administration of ether specifically attested to the date and to the authenticity of that event. It is firmly established that credit for administering the first surgical anesthesia belongs to Crawford Long, honored with a medallion struck in 1912 by his alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania, and with representation in Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. On October 16, 1846, the curtain was finally and forever raised on the use of surgical anesthesia. Arrangements were made for the dentist Morton to administer anesthesia for removal of a vascular tumor from the neck of Gilbert Abbott. The surgeon was John C. Warren, professor of surgery at Harvard Medical College. Morton arrived late, prompting Warren to remark, Well, sir, your patient is ready. After administering the anesthetic through an inhaler, Morton said, Your patient is ready, doctor. When it was apparent that the anesthesia was successful, Warren's concluding remarks to those in the theater were, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. The first paper on etherization was presented November 9, 1846, at a meeting of the Boston Society for Medical Improvement by Henry J. Bigelow, who had made arrangements for Morton's demonstration. The paper was published in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, now the New England Journal of Medicine. Oliver Wendell Holmes, a distinguished member of the Harvard faculty at the time, introduced to the world the noun anesthesia and the adjective anesthetic. Many claims and counterclaims were made about who should receive the credit for the discovery of anesthesia. The three major characters in this drama were William Thomas Green Morton, Horace Wells, 
and Charles Jackson. Horace Wells, like Morton, was a dentist with whom Morton had actually practiced in Hartford, Connecticut. Using nitrous oxide, Wells had successfully anesthetized several patients for dental extractions during 1844 and 1845, but he was discredited when his own demonstration failed at the very same Massachusetts General Hospital. The distinguished Boston physician, geologist, and chemist Charles Jackson laid claim to the discovery of ether anesthesia, insisting that it was he who suggested its use to Morton. In spite of his prominence, Jackson was a circumspect character who urged Congress to mandate that Alexis St. Martin be removed from Beaumont and brought to Boston for more appropriate study. And he also tried to take credit for suggesting to Samuel F. B. Morse the concept of the telegraph. Wells' failure to achieve the recognition he anticipated so depressed him that in 1848 he committed suicide. Jackson spent the last seven years of his life hospitalized in a mental institution. Morton himself died in 1868 at age 48, an impoverished and disappointed man. But it is Morton who deserves the credit. For as Sir Francis Darwin stated, in science, the credit goes to the man who convinces the world, not to the man to whom the idea first occurs. The inscription on Morton's monument reads, Inventor and revealer of anesthetic inhalation, by whom pain in surgery was averted and annulled, before whom in all time surgery was agony, since whom science has controlled the pain. The year the Civil War ended, Joseph Lister began his experiments with antisepsis in Glasgow, Scotland. The first report of these results appeared in 1867 and provided impetus for expansion of surgery in America. On June 15th of that year, John Stowe Bobbs operated on Mary Wiggins, a 30-year-old seamstress with a painful abdominal mass. The operation took place on the third floor of Kiefer and Vinton's Wholesale Drug Company in downtown Indianapolis. The procedure was performed under chloroform anesthesia, and after an abdominal incision was made, a mass five inches in length was incised. As Bob's indicated, limpid fluid escaped, propelling with considerable force several solid bodies about the size of ordinary rifle bullets. One was left because it couldn't be extracted. Bob's concluded that the mass was the gallbladder. He closed the opening. This was the world's first operation on the gallbladder. It was reported in the Transactions of the Indiana State Medical Society of 1868. The next year, the Indiana Medical College was founded, and Bob's was appointed president of the faculty and professor of surgery. The patient, Mary Wiggins, experienced only an occasional episode of abdominal pain throughout the remaining 47 years of her life. Eleven years elapsed before anyone again operated on the gallbladder. It was 1878 when Sims performed what he termed a cholecystotomy, but that procedure was unsuccessful. In the last quarter of the 19th century, two of America's most significant contributions to the field of surgery were made. Both are often neglected when such a list is constructed, but the impact of each transcends all aspects of surgery, and in fact, all of medicine. The first of these contributions was made by John Shaw Billings, who began his career as a military surgeon eventually serving as medical director of the Army of the Potomac in the Civil War. He later became the Assistant Surgeon General of the United States Army and dedicated much of his effort to the expansion of the library of the Surgeon General's office from slightly over 1,000 volumes to what is now the best medical library in the world, the National Library of Medicine in Bethesda, Maryland. In 1879, he and Robert Fletcher brought out the first monthly edition of Index Medicus, which remains an invaluable tool for the retrieval of medical information. But his genius extended to yet another arena. Billings designed the Johns Hopkins Hospital and played a role in the design and conduct of several hospitals throughout the world. In the last 17 years of his life, 
he consolidated the collections of the Astor, Lennox, and Tilden libraries into one single collection, the New York Public Library. Billings documented no significant operation and never held a surgical professorship, but on a daily basis, his achievements contribute to the learning process of all physicians and surgeons. At nearly the same time that the first edition of Index Medicus was published, the American artist Thomas Aikens portrayed Samuel D. Gross at the Gross Clinic of Jefferson Medical College. It was Gross whose efforts led to the founding of the American Surgical Association in 1880, and he became its first president. Almost a decade later, Aikens depicted the Agnew Clinic at the University of Pennsylvania, documenting the change in surgical conduct that had transpired during that one decade. The second major American contribution in the final quarter of the 19th century brings into focus the name of William Stewart Halstead. Halstead established his reputation in New York City where he carried out the first reinfusion of a patient's own blood to treat carbon monoxide poisoning, and his pioneering experiments on conduction and infiltration anesthesia using cocaine. He was given the post as the first professor of surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1889, joining Welsh, Osler, and Kelly to create the four doctors depicted by John Singer Sargent. His key surgical contributions were an operation for hernia and the introduction of radical mastectomy for the treatment of advanced cancer of the breast. He also carried out seminal research in suture placement in the intestine. In the winter of 1894, Halstead's operating room nurse, Caroline Hampton, later to become his wife, complained about allergic reactions to antiseptic solutions. So Halstead had the Goodyear Rubber Company make thin gloves with gauntlets to protect her hands and arms. And shortly thereafter, gloves were used for the first time by a surgeon, Joseph Bloodgood, a member of Halstead's faculty. Several of Halstead's residents who were photographed during what has come to be known as the All-Star Operation include Harvey Cushing, Hugh Young, and John Finney, all of whom went on to become leaders themselves. Unquestionably, Halstead's greatest and most lasting contribution to surgery was the development of a formal and productive residency program for which he merits recognition as the father of modern American surgery. It was also at the end of the 19th century that a significant American contribution focused on a common disorder. In 1886, Reginald Fitz, professor of theory and practice of physics at Harvard Medical School, coined the term appendectomy and advised performing the procedure urgently if symptoms worsened. One of the strongest advocates of the immediate operation for acute appendicitis was the colorful surgeon John Murphy, who was commemorated by the elegant auditorium on Erie Street in Chicago. Murphy also introduced a special button to achieve intestinal anastomosis, but actually this concept had already been introduced by Nicholas Sen of Milwaukee and Chicago, who used decalcified bone plates to affect the same results. Application of the principle of the button for intestinal anastomosis has been rekindled The 20th century began with significant contributions that led to the evolution of vascular surgery. In 1902 in New Orleans, Rudolf Matas treated a traumatic aneurysm using intrasacular sutures to close the openings of all vessels that entered the aneurysm. Shortly thereafter, a quantum leap occurred. Alexis Carrel, 
whose work began in France and continued at the University of Chicago, in collaboration with C.C. Guthrie and Carl Beck, published his first paper in English in 1905. That paper, Anastomosis and Transplantation of Blood Vessels, introduced to the world Carell's technique of using very fine suture material and triangulation of the vessel as a method of re-establishing blood flow after complete transection. He and Guthrie also transplanted vein segments to demonstrate that the vein could replace a segment of the artery, and they also experimented with transplantation of kidneys in dogs. In 1906, Carell began a long association with the Rockefeller Institute, and in 1912, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on vascular suturing and transplantation. This was the first time that the Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded for work carried out in the United States. During the First World War, Carell introduced the technique of irrigating wounds with Dakin's solution as an antiseptic agent. After the war, he concentrated on experiments on organ preservation and was joined in this effort by Charles Lindbergh in 1930, just three years after Lindbergh's pioneering transatlantic flight. One of the surgeons who visited Carell at the University of Chicago was Harvey Cushing, who remained an admirer and close friend of Carell's for many years. Cushing was a product of the Halstead training program. His major interests centered on the pituitary gland, its function, and the surgical treatment of tumors and abnormalities. He coined the terms hypopituitary and hyperpituitary. He performed his first operation on the brain on February 21st, 1902, and he excised more than 2,000 brain tumors during his career. Cushing was largely responsible for the acceptance and permanent identity of neurologic surgery. Another of Cushing's contributions that plays a significant role in modern surgery was the development with W.T. Bovey of electrocautery to control bleeding during an operation. In July 1920, a young surgeon opened his practice in London, Ontario, the province of his birth. Shortly thereafter, because that practice was quite meager, Frederick Banting agreed to lecture on the topic of the pancreas to medical students at the University of Western Ontario. His own notebook documents that on the evening of October 21st, 1920, while preparing his lecture, he wrote, Diabetes, ligate pancreatic ducts of dogs. Keep dogs alive till asini degenerate, leaving islets. Try to isolate the internal secretion of these to relieve glycosuria. Banting negotiated with the professor of physiology at the University of Toronto, J.J. McLeod, to be allowed to return to the laboratory in Toronto to carry out his proposed research project. Six months after his student lecture, he closed his clinical practice and began his research, assisted by a medical student, Charles Best, and shortly later, J.B. Collip, a biochemist. In less than one year, in 1922, the results of their research were presented at a meeting in Washington, D.C., announcing that they had isolated the hormone insulin. This monumental paper appeared in the Transactions of the Association of American Physicians of May 3, 1922. Within weeks of publication of that article, the first patient received insulin in Toronto. Just one week later, Dr. John R. Williams of Rochester, New York, used it to save the life of a dying young man, the first resident in the United States to receive the drug. That patient lived for over 30 years, taking insulin on a daily basis. Within only one additional year, in 1923, Frederick Banting shared the Nobel Prize in Medicine with J.J. McLeod, even though Banting strongly believed that Charles Best was his deserving partner. Their discovery has permanently changed the lives of millions of diabetic patients. As Nobel recipient, he was the second surgeon to have performed his work on North American soil. A decade later, in 1933, 
Everts Graham, professor of surgery at Washington University in St. Louis, performed the first successful pneumonectomy specifically for carcinoma of the lung by isolating the individual hilar structures instead of using mass ligation. Up to this time, carcinoma of the lung was almost always fatal. Graham's patient outlived the surgeon by many years. It was also Everts Graham who was responsible for the development of the American Board of Surgery in 1936. A series of experiments that combined both endocrinology and oncology began in the 1940s in the Laboratory for Cancer Research at the University of Chicago. Charles Huggins, a native of Halifax, demonstrated that the growth of cancer of the prostate could be modified by altering the hormonal milieu of the host. This story of mine is full of um, good luck. Uh, at first, the prostate, we measured the prostate of normal dogs. Sooner or later, we made a mistake and took a senile dog, and the pro prostate gland was, uh, was cancerous. So we said we had been disappointed that the, in elderly dogs, the prostate gland is full of um, malignancy. So we said we'll try to uh, get the effect of um, archaeectomy. And so uh, diethyl stilbestrol. And um, that led to human beings. One of the most remarkable things in medicine, the, uh, the, the relief of pain and suffering is uh, un uh, unbelievable. Huggins was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1966 for contributions that, in the words of the Nobel Prize Committee, have already given many years of an active and useful life to patients with advanced cancer over the entire civilized world. Patients who would have been lost to all other forms of therapy. While Huggins considered the effects of sex hormones on tumor growth, modern surgery has focused on the intestine as an endocrine organ. In a landmark paper presented before the American Surgical Association in 1955, doctors Robert Zollinger and Edwin Ellison described two patients with jejunal ulcers associated with gastric hypersecretion and hyperacidity. In each patient, non-insulin secreting islet cell tumors of the pancreas were found. This clinical report suggested for the first time that gastrointestinal hormones had pathologic and clinical implications. I learned for the first time that surgery wasn't always successful for ulcers. It bugged me a little bit. But they didn't think very much about the uh, cause of the ulcer. Well, then about the same time, I had this 19-year-old girl. She, too, had had a perforation of two jejunal ulcers beyond the ligament of trice. This girl put out 3,700 cc with, I think, 15 times the normal amount of acidity, 15 to 16 times. Now, that's extremely unusual. And she continued to do that after I'd cut off her fundus, left her a small tube of stomach, and after 2,000 Rentgen units of x-ray as recommended by Palmer here in Chicago. So I knew we really had problems. She had a lot of pain. So we finally just agreed that although she was at a young age, we had to take all of her stomach out. I did find an initial operation, a couple little tumors. Nobody could identify it. Well, after we'd, after we'd uh, done, done the total gastrectomy, she got along pretty well, but fed her ups and downs. I began to little little discovered about 10 years later, and I thought, gee, I'd like to look at that pancreas, because her gastrin stayed instead of normal at 150, 200, at about 500, and with a uh, secret and stimulation test, it was about 1,000. What caused it? Because it was felt that the only thing the pancreas could make was insulin. Well, I like to think, and I'm probably just uh, having a wild dream, 
But I'd like to think the gas in Numa uh, uh, was one of the big, great stimulus for the improved antacid therapy we have today. Also along metabolic lines, for years, people had been trying to develop a substitute for oral nutrition. In 1967, Dudrick, Wilmore, Vars, and Rhodes, working at the University of Pennsylvania, demonstrated, first in puppies, that total intravenous feeding achieved growth and development equivalent to what took place with oral intake. This major advance extended surgical management to the nutritionally depleted patient. Perhaps the most notable contributions of the second half of the 20th century were the developments of cardiovascular surgery and organ transplantation. In the field of heart surgery, attention was initially directed at the correction of congenital lesions. It was actually earlier, on August 17, 1938, when Robert Gross, at the Boston Children's Hospital, using a single braided silk suture, for the first time successfully ligated a patent ductus in a seven-year-old girl. The next dramatic event in heart surgery was a palliation of tetralogy of Fallot and extending the life of the blue baby. The concept was proposed by Dr. Helen Tausig, and on November 29, 1944, at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, Dr. Alfred Blaylock, assisted by Dr. William Longmire, and Dr. Blaylock's laboratory technician, Vivian Thomas, performed the operation. After having completed the anastomosis, as you see here, the constricting clamps are removed. Thus allowing blood to go through the pulmonary artery to the right lung again. There was very little bleeding from the anastomosis, so that the clamp will be removed from the right subclavian artery. The suture holding it in place is cut, and the clamp is removed, thus establishing the anastomosis. In other words, an artificial ductus, arteriosus. The patient survived, and the blue baby became a pink child. The challenge of cardiac surgery was to operate within the chambers of an empty heart, and that challenge was met initially at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Hypothermia was the first approach to extend the time of interruption of the circulation while the heart was empty. In 1952, F. John Lewis and Richard Varco closed an atrial septal defect using hypothermia, chilling a patient to 28 to 30 degrees centigrade. The first successful operation on a heart with no blood flowing through it to close a ventricular septal defect where hypothermia was not used and time was not a factor took place in 1954 when C. Walton Lillehigh and Associates hooked up a child to its father to create a cross circulation so that the child's blood could be oxygenated without passing through the child's heart and lungs. A tetralogy of Fallot was totally corrected for the first time on August 31st, 1954. In 1955, Richard DeWall developed a bubble oxygenator to replace cross circulation, and this was used for many years. The refinement of the heart-lung machine has been the keystone of current cardiac surgery. John Gibbon began his work with his wife in Boston in the 1930s using stray cats they caught and second-hand machinery parts. They continued their experiments in Philadelphia at Jefferson Medical College. The first patient was operated on in 1952 and died. In 1953, a large atrial septal defect was closed in an 18-year-old girl using Gibbon's heart-lung machine. Gibbon then operated on two more patients using this technique. They unfortunately died, and he did not use his machine again. But the design provided a prototype for today's refined apparatus. In peripheral vascular surgery, major contributions were made by American residents during their training. In 1952, 
Arthur Voorhees at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital demonstrated that Vignon N cloth could be used as a substitute for natural tissue to carry blood. This led to the refinement and widespread use of prosthetic grafts. In 1963, Thomas Fogarty reported success with a modified Foley catheter to remove emboli and thrombi from blood vessels. The most modern addition to surgery is organ transplantation. Innovations in this field are dominated by American surgeons. In 1990, Joseph Murray received the Nobel Prize for his contributions to the field of renal transplantation. Uh, we had to assure or ascertain that a transplant per se could function in the absence of any immunological barriers. So the first two years I spent developing a kidney transplant operation in the dog, which could give perfectly normal renal function. So we had all our ducks in order when in December of 54 appeared on our doorstep a person dying of kidney disease who happened to have an identical twin who was a potential donor. Interestingly, the patient was referred to the Brigham with the idea of a transplant by the referring physician uh, because we all knew that identical twins could accept skin grafts one from another. And this was the first time in history that it had a living donor of an organ had ever been attempted. It was a spectacular success. I'll never forget releasing the clamps of the kidney and it just poured out urine. The next day, the patient was like a new man. He had an appetite, he had a spark to his eyes, so we knew we had something good. And this success stimulated and revivified interest in transplantation worldwide. Then, um, during the 50s, uh, we continued our laboratory program trying to break down the immunological barrier in many different ways. But nothing was consistent until the development of immunosuppressive drugs. And that was the real breakthrough. But it was more remarkable. It was just an eight-year period, 1954 to 1962. And as we look back on it, it was a tremendously exciting time. Transplantation of the liver was initiated by Thomas Starzo, and his relentless efforts have made this surgical procedure acceptable throughout the world. Well, I'm a little hesitant to begin in 1963 because uh, we uh, attempted the procedure in humans for the first time, and the first patient that I operated on, uh, which was on the 1st of March, 1963, uh, bled to death on the operating table. This was followed by two more who survived the operation but then died uh, um, within three weeks afterwards. Um, so there, were, there was quite a lot of background and I thought we, were, we could succeed. Uh, but uh, as is well known, we did not uh, at the outset. I had reported our failures at the American Surgical Association in 1964, and I felt at that time a chill of disapprobation from some of the discussers. But the reception in 1968 was a warm one, and I was especially grateful to Franny Moore for his, uh, his comments. It almost... Um, led to a pariah syndrome, if I can put it that way. Um, the universities didn't want, by and large, to support this kind of a program. It was expensive, it exhausted the personnel, and it failed too often. I, one of these talk shows was having a, a vote, a uh, call-in vote from the listeners to determine whether this thing had to be stopped or whether it could be allowed to go on, and I was listening to this amazed by it. Uh, and I don't know what the vote was, uh, but um, not long after that, we did a little boy named Todd McNeely. A few days later, the recipient who had biliary atresia was 
running happily around the halls and behaving as we knew was uh, uh, possible. It has become uh, the acknowledged um, best and in most instances the only treatment for truly end-stage liver disease. So um, uh, that's clear now. The need for it exceeds the organ supply. So the next uh, barrier, and it is apt to be a very tough one, is to be able to use animal organs in humans. And like every other step that was taken, uh, it's going to be a hard one to take, and it will be accompanied by uh, controversy, you can be sure of that. In cardiac transplantation, although the name Christian Barnard is remembered for the daring initial application of the operation in humans, Norman Shumway has developed the procedure to its present point of acceptance. And the operation that he performed with Richard Lauer is still used, unmodified, by all heart surgeons doing heart transplants. The major advances in medicine and surgery developed largely as intellectual quantum leaps made by heroic individuals who were often not appreciated and even ridiculed at the time. Today's senior surgeons believe they have witnessed and participated in the golden age of surgery. They cite as examples the initiation and evolution of cardiovascular surgery and organ transplantation that developed during their professional lives. Now perhaps this is the golden age of surgery, but one golden age does not preclude another. Many of the meaningful contributions that will evolve in the field of surgery are currently believed to be impossibilities, but today's audience contains tomorrow's heroes. There is no end to America's contributions to surgery. There is an ever-expanding future.